Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it has been uh, another week. Um, I had surgery last Friday to remove a couple of impacted wisdom teeth, and uh, uh, my mouth's still kind of sore, but I'm in a lot better shape than I was over the weekend. Um, in fact, I was feeling good enough for a, a client meeting in New York on Monday morning, although I was just KTFO by the time I, I got home. Unlike the previous escapade that I talked about, um, I was pretty sparing with the, the pain pills this time, and I... I seem to be managing okay. I got back to solid food, and I'm uh, pretty glad that I've, I've managed to drop about 11 or 12 pounds in two weeks, which means I've finally managed to hit the, the target weight I've been after since 2021, albeit not in the most healthy ways to pursue that. But but anyway, um, the downside is this whole situation, the wisdom tooth infection, the, the treating that, the uh, uh, surgery, etc., has kind of left me a couple weeks behind on work, which is a real problem because I've uh, well, I've got this conference to to plan and host and all sorts of stuff to take care of while also doing the lobbying and and advocacy work and and the back office stuff like billing and generally being Mister Wonderful and and you know all the other tasks that make up my day job running a, a pharmaceutical industry trade association. Um, but the wave ought to break in, I'll say, about two months or so. Um, and I do have plenty of guests lined up for, for that whole period and, and beyond, as long as I can make the time to, to read all their stuff and, and get the weekends free to, to record with them. But, so, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot keeping me busy, and the physical stuff is not making me super happy, but whatever. I could drone on ad infinitum, ad nauseum, as as you guys know. Uh, but you're here for the transcendent conversation, not the, the boring monologue. And um, and I'm here with some transcendent conversation this week. My guest is Jerome Charon, who has a new novel out this week called Ravage and Son from Bellevue Literary Press. Ravage is R-A-V-A-G-E, just you know, like the regular word. Ravage and Son is... Well, it's a historical novel. It is about the Jewish Lower East Side in New York City around 1913. And it is absolute dynamite. Um, unlike the novels I've, I've talked about with Jerome in past shows, this one is not biographical fiction. There is a key biographical figure in it, Abraham Kahan, but he's not the lead. It's not in his voice. Um <sighs> But this book might be the most alive novel of Jerome's that I've I've read, which isn't a knock on the other ones. It's just the, well, we'll talk about the vividness of this, this one. Ravage and Son centers on a semi-private detective named Ben Ravage and his mysterious family legacy. Uh, semi-private as in Ben works for the Kahila, the, the sort of local Jewish community and its bosses. Um, and he's well, he's trying to stop a, a Mr. Hyde-like brute who is abusing sex workers and, and causing trouble by night in the Lower East Side. But in the process, Ben uncovers some secrets about himself and how his corner of New York is is really run. It's um it's a noir. It is it's a crime novel. It is hard boiled. It's Jewish. It is about immigrants. It is it is something. Uh, and that stuff is just describing the plot somewhat vaguely. The joy of Ravage and Son comes in just every sentence that Jerome crafts and and in the passions that, that guide his characters and how well he, he evokes all that. And, and in the care he takes in, in bringing their world to life and giving us an idea of, of New York of over 100 years ago and what it is and what it was. 
the novel goes to some operatic extremes, which we, we talk about, but the characters stay deeply, deeply human, even in the, the worst or most extreme of circumstances. He, he, well, he just creates an absolute marvel. Ravage and Son is a fantastic novel of a lost time, a, um, a glorious and dingy, dirty moment in a city that's, that's constantly in flux. I love this book, and I, I was awfully happy to sit down with Jerome for another talk, which I, is our fourth one, I believe. Now, the thing I'd like to add is that over the course of those, these four conversations now, Jerome has become one of my favorite guests to talk to. Um, and I think it's because of something he mentions early on this time, uh, something I, I, I think I got but didn't get uh, until you know we, we had these repeated talks, and that is that he's not really here, that Jerome is a sort of monk, like this, this devotee or disciple of the word. And even when we're sitting down and talking, the, the machine is still going on inside him. He's still, he's still, he's still writing in there. He's, he's distilled everything else in life down to the act of writing. And it's fascinating to sit with somebody who's reached that state I mean, sure, there are day-to-day -day distractions for him, like there are for all of us. But, but the sense of purpose that he uh, that he emanates is it's something to behold. So I'm glad we got to sit down for this one, and I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Those caveats go. There's just air conditioning noise. I filtered that out as best I could. Uh, his cat walks in at one point. Oh, and, and he had, Jerome had to get up at uh, one stop and, and you know, sort of walk around and stretch his legs for a little bit. Um, my Apple Watch has me do the same thing every hour, um, which I've long said is often like a Tamagotchi thing, uh, except I'm not really sure which one of us is the Tamagotchi. Either I'm getting up to satisfy my watch or my watch is trying to keep me alive by getting me up. So anyway, uh, Jerome had to get up and walk around, but I make a little interjection in the episode when that happens. So you'll you'll know. Also, uh, to my disappointment, we did not get around to discussing the coming NBA season or the recent Denver Nuggets NBA championship, but maybe next time. Now, here's Jerome's bio. Jerome Charon is the author of more than 50 works of fiction and nonfiction, including Ravage and Son, Sergeant Salinger, César, a novel of war-torn Berlin, In the Shadow of King Saul, essays on silence and song, Jersey, a novel, and A Loaded Gun, Emily Dickinson for the 21st Century. Among other honors, his work has been long-listed for the Mark Twain American Voice and Literature Award and Penn Award for Biography, and shortlisted for the Phi Beta Kappa Christian Gauss Award, and selected as a finalist for the Firecracker Award and Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Jerome has also been named a Commander of Arts and Letters by the French Minister of Culture and received a Guggenheim Fellowship and the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award for Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He lives in New York City. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Jerome Charon, already in progress. You know, that whole Yale gang yeah. propelled is just another literary theory. And finally, a text is greater than any theory. Right. And this is, I'm, again, I'm talking with Ron Rosenbaum yeah. after this, and he was a Yale undergrad and then right. started in the PhD program, and he quit for that exact reason. Like, there was a point, I guess that would have been, even in the 60s, before the deconstructionist stuff started, there was a degree of theory. Yeah. And he was just like, no, you, it's about reading the book. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's and, not about the... And the thing yeah. is that uh, you can't divorce the writer from the text. The text, there's something in... The, the writer is embedded in the text. Yeah, Ron's thing was, he was averse to what he calls biographical criticism. Yeah. But it sounds like you're talking in the other direction, that the, 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 the artist suffuses their own work. Yeah, I mean, finally, I mean, and it's something that, that Borges said that, that, that I always believed, is that a writer writes all these texts all his life and suddenly discovers at the end of his writing that all he's doing is writing a description of his own face. Yeah. You know, you can't get away from 
yourself no matter what what text you write. You you are your reader, you are your audience, you are, you are you know, you are the world of, of of the text. And maybe other readers intrude and maybe some people say, well, uh, I'm writing this book for this audience, uh, you know, 16-year-olds or whatever yeah. it is. Like I'm doing a YA novel and I'm asking Lenore to go over it to see if, you know, if what I write that, would that's make the, sense. Yeah. To, yeah. But on the other hand, I'm not writing it for them. I'm writing it for me, you know. So tell me about Ravage and Son. It, it, uh, uh, let me preface first. This is yeah. the first time you and I are talking about a non-biographical fiction. Right. Yeah. This book, to me, feels different than the other ones I've read of yours, and it feels loved yeah. in a way that I don't know exactly how to characterize, and I'm wondering like, this book well, and what it meant to you. you. You're right, except the, the other one that, that is closest to it is Cesar. Which I haven't the, read. The, the, That's the one know, I haven't gotten together read. with you about. Yeah. The, the thing is that... Um, um, you know, you can go into dream theory. In, in your dreams, every character you dream about is really yourself. Doesn't matter what guys they mm -hmm. they take. So uh, every character you write about, in some sense, is yourself, and yet you're creating a world. So it it seems to me, before I get into Ravage and Son. I think it applies to everything, at least in terms of myself. The word, the word is far more real than the world. Yeah. In other words, what, where I live is in the text. When I'm sitting here with you, I'm sitting here with you. It doesn't mean that you know it isn't pleasant, it isn't fun. We, we're having a good time, but that's not where I'm living. Yeah. I'm living in the word that I write. And that's the only life that I have. And that's what I, when I was trying to explain it to my wife, this book, I, I, yeah. that sense of love isn't love for the characters. It feels like love for the prose in a way that somehow differs from, from some of the well, other books it, I've read it, of yours. It but, might be, but also it, it's very biographical. You know, even though this yeah. text takes place long before my birth, uh, I have to explain that my childhood when I was a kid, every Sunday we went down to my grandparents, and I couldn't stand either of them, so I wouldn't, you know, it was yeah. right a block away from the forward. It was on Henry Street, which is right behind East Broadway, where the forward building was and the Educational Alliance. And what I would do is I would go in, and then I would leave and I would walk around the whole Lower East Side. I would look at the posters of the Yiddish theaters. I would go to Delancey Street and look at the, you know, the Lower East Delancey. And sometimes I'd go into a movie or the How old were you? Oh, this, this would, from the age of five on, it, it would be, let's say, from at least five to ten. I mean, I can't, I remember we took the Third Avenue L down. And um, and it was a magical place. I feel I was born, even though I wasn't born on the Lower East Side, I feel that was my spiritual home. So when I write about the Lower East Side, I'm really writing about, well, the other title would have been Yiddish Land, but that would have been so, yeah, you know, restrictive. personal, <laughs> restricted. And... But finally, it was, it was a land of Jews, of poor Jews, suffering Jews, Jews who were exploited. I mean, just think about the women. Think, if you don't think about the men, think about the women. What could the women do? They couldn't go to school, so they would either get married at 15, okay, which was a kind of bondage, you know, slavery. Let's, it's an ugly word, but we have to use it. Or they would become prostitutes, and I would. The street I, I loved the most was Allen Street because that was a street where, you know, I think the the age of prostitution was already over, but the Third Avenue L was still there, and you walked on Allen Street and you tried to imagine what it must have been like 
with these 15-year-old girls, pimped by their own sisters. So what? they couldn't go to school. Uh, they would either go to a sweatshop or they would get married. So it was prostitution in every form. You know, there was no existence. Okay, they could become mothers, and that was important, and they had children, but when you're a mother at 15, it ain't, it ain't so great. It's no life you know? of your own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so your life is basically over. Uh, so what was your entry point for the novel? Well, it was Abraham Kahan, yeah. you know, he was, you know, in, when you write about him, they say Ab, A-B, but that means in Yiddish it was Avram, so yeah. the A-B standard for an A-V, you know, but I call him Abraham Kahan, and um, I always wanted to write about I don't know if you know anything about the Bento Brief, the letters that... No, uh, it's, it's stuff that I helped pick yeah, up from well, the novel. It's yeah. very interesting. It's yeah. a Lonely Hearts column. He didn't start it. It was started by um, by Hearst. It was a Lonely Hearts column. He took it over. And what, what he did is that women and men would write to him, you know, about, you know, their sadness, their grief. Uh, a woman is in love with a boarder and wants to run off with that boarder and, uh, you know, because people were too poor, they had to take boarders in yeah. to live with them. So, and he would rewrite these mental briefs and turn them into his own prose. And they became world famous. They still exist, the mental brief. You know? So, he was someone who interested me. I mean, he became very conservative near the end of his life, and he supported the Vietnam War. Well, I did, you know, in a way, too, because I, I thought that um, foolishly and stupidly that, <laughs> as a, you know, I wasn't a kid, and I, you know, I, I, was, I was against the war um, when I was at Stanford, and, you know, I would tell people about the war, et cetera, et cetera. But in one sense, I had the foolish notion, the childish notion, that we were bringing democracy to... I went know. through the same thing in the 2000s. Yeah. I, I Trust me, I, I had the same, oh, actually, it's an admirable goal. Yeah. We're, we're trying to yeah. create a, a new world and realized... But it's a lie, yeah. because if you, look, if you look at our country today, we're in the worst. You know, we're presiding over the end, not only the end of the civil of a civilization, our civilization, but the end of the earth. You know, we're not going to last more than a hundred years. Look, look how hot it is now. You go into the ocean, and it's a steam bath. Right. So there's no place to do. There's nothing. You know, and yet I still enjoy sitting. Now I have this. My assistant from France built this big. You know. Thing so I can I can look at it because my eyes aren't so terrific. But um, the thing is, I I have the same pleasure now that I had when I started writing. I don't know, 55 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, maybe more. Uh, it's for yourself. Yeah. It's for yourself. And yes, you need the world out there. You need the commerce. You need the sale of books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But finally, at this age, it's pretty much irrelevant. Hmm. You know, your, your life is with the page, with the characters, because remember, in spite of what Bloom and, and all the critics say about what this or that means, either the characters live and they have a life, or they don't. And if they don't, they don't exist, you know. Yeah, that's... There is a vivacity throughout this book where you yeah. know I was just compelled, not in the oh I want to find out what happens, but that deep feeling for the, these characters. It's just something where I wondered how how long you had lived with this book in particular. Oh, what, what, what happened is that I wrote it a long time ago, and um, I had two two publishers at mm -hmm. the time, at Bellevue and and uh, Norton. And the thing is, my editor at Norton, Bob Weil. It took him, since he was editing so many books and edited them so closely, uh, 
very often between drafts there would be a three month period. So I would keep going back to that to that book and I added the preface which I love best I, yeah. about Chloe you know and that only came when I got a cat and where is the cat is she <laughs> hiding, hiding right somewhere? now I think I've, she, I've taken over most of her space yeah so. <laughs> she's hiding I'm probably under the bed but anyway once she came into my life um, suddenly there she was so I did the preface and the preface then changed the rest the tone the tone of the book and, and, and the other thing is the fantasy. You live in a fantasy world. I always wanted to go to Harvard. And I didn't dare apply because I didn't have any money. I, my college boards were good, but you know I was also another kid from New York. They had millions of kids from New York. So I never applied. But I always had my characters going to Harvard. <laughs> you know, and then Ravage graduates yeah. from Harvard, and he doesn't go on to become a lawyer, he goes back to the Lower East Side. He doesn't graduate. You see, that's, that's you know, he, he goes back to the world he came from. And how, how much did the book change for you from your original? Oh, image? the whole the whole book changed, yeah. you know. Uh, as I say, you know, this is written over a period of about 10 years. And uh, every time... Bob Weil was doing the draft of another book, I, I would return to this. And uh, Cesar, which you haven't read, and this book are, are, the, are the books that I love most because in a way they're the most personal. Go back and read that. That, that was, I think, just around pandemic time. I think yes. it was coming and that was the, yeah. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing with my show life, etc. Yeah. So I if put you get a chance, on read it in relation to this and you'll yeah. see a real resemblance, even though that's about Nazi Germany, but you'll see the heroes, Ben Ravage and the hero of, uh, of, of Cesar are, are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. They're myself. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm putting myself into the landscape I write about and I become one of the characters. It's like playing a video game where I'm in the game, yeah. you know, and, uh, and I change the course of the character trajectory according to where I am and who I am, you know, and what I would want to do, you know. How much so of that... that that's oh. the only logic. The only mm -hmm. logic of the book is what it is that I want to do. When did you find yourself in that, in the books? How long into your, your writing career? Or was that there from the beginning, essentially? I think it was there from the very beginning, you know, because remember, I, I was lucky enough being very poor and not apply, even applying to Harvard, which I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten into. I went to Columbia and that was probably the greatest education in the world because it was all about the holiness of books. Books were religion. We had the best English faculty in the world at that time, including Lionel, Lionel Trilling and F.W. Dupee and people probably you never heard about. But they were wonderful teachers. And, and not only that, when we would have colloquiums, that, that is, the very best students. I, I wasn't the best, but I was among, you know, that is, the top 10 students would then meet with, well, I think 12 students, would meet for the, for the third and fourth year, your, your junior and senior year, with two professors once a week, and you would read a book, and you had a, an older professor and a junior professor. And these kids were so smart. One of them became a Nobel Prize winner. I won't mention their, their names. One of them became a president of a university. One of them is a novelist like myself. <clears throat> but they were all, you know, rabid about words and language. And in both classes, the junior professors had to bow out because they weren't as good as the students. Wow. Okay. They just couldn't keep up. There was some, there was one student who was so eloquent in what he said, never mind what he wrote, that he spoke poetry, you know. 
and it was a, it was a, so that school, even though I wasn't happy there, you know, it was all male. Barnard and Columbia didn't yeah. go together. But the thing is, it gave me the sense of books were religious articles. They were Bibles. And the holiness of the book was all that mattered, not the career. I mean, one of the professors would give me Norman Mailer's galleys, you know, he was asked to read Norman Mailer's book, and I would think about being a writer, et cetera, et cetera. But it was more the holiness of the word, you know. And also, at that point, you would define... If you were educated, you had read War and Peace. If you didn't read War and Peace, you weren't educated. Yeah. You know, that's the way the world was. And uh, I read everything. And the thing is, I don't read anything now. It's really amazing. I only read my own prose. It's very hard for me to read other writers now. And I just read a wonderful essay um, about Joyce Carol Oates in the New York Times about... How, she, how much she reads and how important she reads. But it's very difficult for me to read other writers now. I do read, you know, I read her. I mean, I read friends, contemporaries, sure. et cetera, et cetera. But I'm more in, into, into the right. sound of my own prose. I was going to say refining what you're, what yeah, you're writing. The music of it. To me, it's poetry. I, I always, I'm not a poet. But I write poetry in novels. I'm not a poet. I don't consider myself a poet. Have you tried poems? No, I, I do have poems sometimes in the novels. But I, yeah, I did write love poems to one girl. You know. Yeah, but I mean, you know, have you tried no, it, quote no, unquote, seriously? I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. have any idea what the uh, matrix of a poem is about. Mm. I love Emily Dickinson and and I love Shakespeare. Those are the the two writers that, um, to me, are beyond anything that you can say. That every phrase amazes you. The positioning of the words are, is just so incredible in both writers that you just can't understand how they were able to twist language around in such an extraordinary way. I still am overwhelmed when I read Shakespeare. Hamlet is my favorite work, and and uh, one or two of Emily Dickinson's poems. Or you know, I just I, I just can't understand how she was able to. It's not the sentences themselves; it's the way words come together. I just don't understand the brilliance. I mean, I, I understand yeah, the but brilliance, you, but, but I don't know how, how she somebody did it. Did it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how she constructed it. It's your other book I need to read, your your Dickinson novel, because yeah. I never read her until somewhat recently. You should read that book. Oh, yeah. I, I will. And, and, and you should also read A Loaded Gun, which is the nonfiction book I yeah. wrote about. I Back in November of last year, I was up in Amherst to record with a former right. professor of mine from college yeah. and then just went for a walk in town and did you go to Amherst uh, I went to Hampshire Hampshire the, the right. trippy college near yeah, Amherst right. and so in Amherst itself I went wandering around and so hey there's an old cemetery back there I should go take a look and uh, yeah, go yeah, walking up is, and yeah, yeah lo and behold I'm standing yeah. next to Emily Dickinson's grave yeah. picked up a collected volume of her stuff and since then every morning two pages and then the next morning, I, randomly within the book, the next but, morning I read the same two yeah. pages, trying to make sense of what I read the day before. But not only, and not only that, ones. please yeah. read her letters. They're, yeah. they're the greatest lo letters in the English language. I will pick them up while I'm crossing town today for yeah. my second show. Yeah, it, it's one of those revelations, and I don't know. I know why I didn't because I wasn't into poetry, and I had this bias well, against female writers or something. I started out reading poetry, but, not writing yeah. poetry, but yeah. Before I read fiction, I read poetry. And were they the two lodestars then for you, or did you grow into Shakespeare? And well, Dickinson? I loved I loved the the music. Uh, the music to me is is the essential word, and you shape the sentences around the music and the meaning. I always insist. I know it. It's hard to comprehend, but the meaning comes from the music. 
and that's it. There's only the music. There's nothing else. Yeah. The book and then, sings. of course, there's the characters. That you, but the characters have to be built out of that, the music. How does writing a well, writing a book like this differ from the again the biographical fictions where you don't have the 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 person's framework of a life? Well, um, you have to enter. In, in in other words, when I wrote, uh, and I had a very different title for the Lincoln novel. I'm sorry that that title was used. But the thing is, um, I inhabited Lincoln's voice for so long that for a year I, I couldn't write. I was, everything I wrote was in Lincoln's voice, you know. And also, I, I really didn't like Lincoln before I began to read about him, and he seemed like such a cliche. And then when I read about him, I said, He's the most extraordinary man who ever lived. <laughs> the two people I admire most are Abraham Lincoln and Malcolm X. Yeah. And Malcolm X, you know, his journey from being what, what was it, red, yeah. what would they call yeah. him? He had a nickname, Big Red or Red yeah. or whatever. Because yeah, he had reddish cock, hair. Uh, yeah. yes, uh, and his movement from being this thief into being a kind of uh, priest, you know, and and understanding that, I love when he said, uh, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. And the fact is that he was not racist in any way, and he didn't, he believed, I th well, in, at least the way I read it, that one, that the, the races could come together and, and, and live together and conspire together. That it, was, that, that it was not simply a black world versus a white world. Does that sense of transformation drive you when it comes to, to people you're interested in? You talk about Lincoln and... and no, yes, I think that that is, is the uh, is the greatest sadness about life and our culture is the fact that the culture cannot seem to accept black people. Yeah. And I mean, you can talk about it any way you want, but until we solve that problem, we won't have a country, yeah. and we don't have a country at the moment. And that's. Yeah, it's it's a white people's problem. Is is how the black uh, uh, guests I've had who have been discussing racism in in yeah. their work talk about it. It's like it's it's not us. It's something white people have to fix in themselves. But and to some degree they can't. Yeah, and that's why we're stuck where we are. Mm -hmm. That's why we have these red states. It's only about the inability, not in homophobic and. LGBT, yeah. you know, in, in other words, uh, transgender, they, they, can't, uh, they can't understand that all of us are both male and female, and that the selection is an interior one, and there's nothing to do with anyone's business, you know. If a person feels that he or she is male or female, that is a very private decision, or both, or bisexual, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, but it seems to me that uh, this gender fluidity is is essential, and um, and not new and, by any means. Yeah, and yeah. unless we come to deal with it, we're going to be destroyed, and I think we are going to be destroyed. But may, we may be, we may get lucky. We may find someone who can lead us out of this terrible, terrible morass that we're in. Maybe it's Biden. I don't know. I don't know. Worse than the Vietnam era? Much worse, because yeah. we never had someone like Trump who is willing to destroy the entire universe if he doesn't get his way. And that's where his power lies. And I must say, his game plan, you know, if you don't accept me, you don't have anything. That's what yeah. he's saying. It works like a charm. Yeah. I'll also give him credit for the political savvy 
to know that Biden was the guy who could take him out. The, the yeah. reason he got impeached the first time was trying right. to get dirt on Biden. He knew. He knew of all the, the candidates, that was the guy who could undercut his appeal. Well, I think and, it was more his advisors who knew, but I... I, I, I suspect Trump knew deep down that Biden was the, the real threat to him. But again, we, we all have our... No, no, you, you're, you're right, because Biden could eat into his, you know, electorate, you know, the sort of lower middle class... Yeah. Working Whereas class. everybody else's, the younger yeah. candidates were all sort of perceived as, as yeah. No, elite. I think you're yeah. absolutely right. But, but yeah. whether it came from him or someone else, I, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't really say. But the fact is, he's taking on not only this country, but the entire universe. And there's a chance he'll win, yeah. which means he'll bring everything down with him. You know? And let's hope... And the, I'm glad we have Jack Smith because he's the only one who seems to be able to say, fuck you, yeah. you know, I'm not giving you anything. He's get more charges coming. Yeah. Well, we're on that thread. Anti-Semitism within Ravage and Son and, and, and within today. Yeah, the, the anti-Semitism is very, very sad because... Uh, I was just thinking um, about um, the whole notion of um, of what happened to the six million Jews, or probably there were more than six million, and I see it in a different way. I I see it as a victory rather than a defeat. They sacrificed themselves so that we could all live. In other words. Because of all the German soldiers and the guards that had to deal with the concentration camps, they couldn't mount two fronts, and therefore, you know, we won at Normandy, which we wouldn't have won if there were no concentration camps. So those six million people who sacrificed their lives really saved us. And I would love to see a piece of literature, and I think in Cesar, I tried to do that, is to turn those people into heroes rather than victims, even though they were victimized and, and their deaths were horrible. We're here because of them. Yeah. And it's a strange thing to say, but I think it's true. And when did your family come to America? My, my family was very lucky in that um, my grandparents came here be, before the terrible immigration law of 1924, which excluded most people from Eastern Europe. They arrived, uh, my two grandfathers arrived before, and because Tammany Hall needed votes, even though they couldn't speak a word of English, uh, they were made citizens. And because they were citizens, both my mother and my father were able to come here after 1924, which they never would have been able to do. They would have died in Europe if their two, if their own parents hadn't become citizens because of Tammany Hall needing their votes. <laughs> so it's out of corruption. Sometimes good things happen. Yeah, how much research went into? Ravage and Son, or how much of it was research you'd just been doing for, well, for decades anyway? Well, I had to research anyway. about the life of Abraham sure, sure. Khan, but I knew everything about the Lower East Side because yeah. I went there. It was really my spiritual home. It still is, even though, you know, I, I, I have difficulty walking, so I don't think I could walk there. But I used to walk to the Lower East Side every day, let's say in my 40s, when I was still... You know, I moved to Paris, but while I was still living here, I would go walk to the Lower East Side every day. What do you miss from there? I know a lot's changed. Well, it's become gentrified now, but I love the tenements. I love the Orchard Street, the, the markets. The, um, I love the poverty. I love the sadness. I love the fact that you know, maybe landlords were earning money out of it, but you couldn't avoid the poverty. It was straight there. 
and the fact that these people had no way of escaping, except the only way you could escape is through education. And it, it still is true. Mm -hmm. Education is the only way that you can get out of whatever hole that you're in. And I, I was lucky because um, I went to school at a time when Columbia was not very expensive and I had the best teachers in the world, not all of them, you know. Until I went to college, I didn't realize that teachers were not stupid because all the teachers I had yeah. up to that point, you know, they didn't know any more than I did. You Brown's know. public school system. Yeah. Well, I went to a wonderful high school, the high school of music and art. But, you know, when you read a text, they couldn't read Hamlet. They couldn't even read The Tale of Two Cities. What is The Tale of Two Cities about, you know? It's about this guy, Sidney Carton, who can only survive when he's on the guillotine because it's the only place that is, is, uh, is safe for him. It's mm -hmm. the, I mean, it's such a strange world. I mean, Dickens is, is, is another one that you could probably compare to Shakespeare in that he explored London in such an extraordinary way. He couldn't write about women. He was terrible in his description of women. But his, the way he named characters, I mean, yeah. I remember there was a character called Jerry Cruncher. Now, how do you get a name <laughs> like that? I mean, I still remember it from high school. And also, since I'm writing this, you know, YA book, I'm talking about, you know, texts that I read in high school and what they meant, because the, the, the hero goes to music and art. And, and I was the same, it was the same way for me. I mean, there were so many more girl students that the males that they took in were at much poorer, you know, academic credentials, but they were hard up for boys. So if you went in there and you could draw a straight line, you got in. But unfortunately, you know, what the saddest thing I can think about in my life is my brother didn't get into music and art. Now, how he didn't get into music and art, I don't understand. I was the worst artist in the world, and I got in, and he didn't, got in, he didn't get in. And if he had gotten into music and art, his whole life would have been changed. What did he, he end up doing? He became a homicide detective. Ah, oh, that's right. He's basically a killer. Yeah. He just was a killer. But if he had gone to music and art, it would have softened him a bit. And I love my brother because he saved my life. My parents were crazy. So, in other words, the, my life is basically in the text, you know. I have a cat, I have Lenore, you know, and I love them both. And they are real to me, but... And the cat is extraordinarily real because the cat makes me laugh. <laughs> but I'm in the text, yeah. even when I'm not sitting there, I'm always in the text. Even when I'm not in the middle of writing something, I'm thinking about what I could have done, what I should have done. What I, there's always the book that you should have written that you never wrote. And what's amazing to me about Joyce Carol Oates is that she can enter into any genre and master it. You know, I can't do that. She can write poetry. She can write short stories. Her book about boxing, I don't know if you've no, read you've it, seen it. Yeah. Is, is, is unbelievable. I mean, she, it's better than any man could have written about mm -hmm. boxing. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So. It, it was an anecdote from what I recorded with Otto Penzler uh, back in 2019 yeah. that uh, he told me the story of, and it was on tape, so I'm not revealing anything. Uh, she sent a mystery novel or crime novel to him, yeah. and uh, it was not good. Yeah. And he didn't know how to tell her that or yeah. her agent because, my God, this is Joyce Carol Oates. Yeah. And uh, he kept kind of hiding until the agent finally got a hold of him, and he's like, 
I, I can't publish it. It's, it's, yeah. it's not good. And it will give us some notes. Gives her notes. She comes back six weeks later with a phenomenal exactly. crime novel. And that was the, oh, it's okay to tell a great writer that this didn't work yeah. because they will learn from it and make something yeah. better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he just had this reverence and, and fear that, right. uh, you know, I'm going to ruin things. But yeah, that ability to, to keep crossing boundaries, I guess. Um, again, when you talk about fluidity, that's, that's Joyce Carol Oates and, and yeah, her and she, career. And, and, and she told me that when she was, she was a child, the words had a, a tactile sense that I never felt that. And she began writing novels at a very early age, and I think that uh, she had four novels by the age of 14. So she's just, and she's an extraordinary critic. I mean, you read her criticism. I mean, Would just, you say then that while you're, you talk about your prose and its musicality, that hers yeah. would be sculptural? In that respect, I mean, would you see that as a metaphor for how she might yeah, see? Yeah, I, I, well, she might not feel it that way, but I mean, I, I, I could think. I, I, well, I would say she's polymorphous. She mm -hmm. could enter. If it's a crime novel, it's it's a crime novel. If it's this, you know, she can enter into any landscape and and find a way of mastering. Yeah. Uh, in the novel, you, you do bring the master, the, yeah. the Henry James, into yeah. the, the book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're laughing over that. Tell me, is this something Kahan meets with him? Was this something after well, reality something, or just no, something you wanted to create? No, it, you know, I, I, I have a very ambivalent feeling about Henry James. I think he's probably, he is the master, but I hate him because... You could put all of his sympathy on the head of a pin, and that's all it would be. There, there's no, you know, there, he's able to create such a distance between himself and his characters, which is marvelous, you know. But I didn't really like what he said about uh, the Jews of the Lower East Side in the American scene. He went to Ellis Island with Kahan. Yeah. That, that's a so true story. So there was story. a true story? Okay. That's a true story. Yeah. And... Um, and he wept at what he saw. I mean, he really saw the horror of it. But he also felt that Yiddish would destroy the English language. Now, how how could he possibly? <laughs> because uh, he lived in England, and we know the English hate Jews. I, know, I'm, I'm just, you know, yeah. projecting. Um, but, but, yeah. but so I have a very strange attitude about I love The Beast in the Jungle I think it's one of you know it's a masterwork and I love the, the American uh, you know the you know, I, I love some of his novels he's a master but he's at such a distance from what he writes you know he's such Olympian Olympian. Okay, you have better language than I do, but <laughs> yeah, okay. there, there is something that, and his anti-Semitism was, which was prevalent. So it, you can't only. It's unfair for me to blame him about anti-Semitism, when probably anybody, other than him, would have felt the same way. But what he said about. Um, Jews to me was unforgivable, and I I, I can't forgive it. But especially immigrant Jews, the, the, the immigrant Eastern Jews, European. Yes, of course. It was but like, yet, I, I wanted to write about him, and I thought it was a good description. Oh, it was a, it's a great passage in the yeah. book. It, it it works masterfully within yeah. the the, uh, the the chapter that it, it uh, contains it. It reminds me of um, God. I think it's in Amsterdam, the the Jewish museum, and I, I was watching this this history of of yeah. Jews in Amsterdam and. There was a, it, we were perfectly assimilated, and then the Russian Jews showed up, and all of a yeah. sudden, we were all Jews. That was... Yeah, well, this is the, <laughs> the exact, we all, well, you saw that in yeah. the book, in that... The 400 uh, are... are the, the, you know, the German Jews, they built the educational alliance so that they could educate the Eastern European Jews, and the, and the Kahila, the secret service, was 
men to fight Jewish crime on the Lower East Side, and they were basically informers for the for the police. You know, so it's it's a very sad. In other words, it's a very sad tale about a sad time. But it's interesting that out of sadness comes an extraordinary beauty. And this is what I wanted to write about. The beauty that came out of all the, the, the pain. You can't have beauty without pain. And it's, it's operatic uh, it at times, this book. It, it really... Yeah, I mean, up to the, the big climactic... Yeah, and, and I finished it, a novel on, on Maria Callas. I was going to ask, where are you on the Callas novel? It's going to be published in 2025. Oh, God, I'm going to have to come back. Yeah. <laughs> but that opera quality? Well, I didn't know very much about opera. The only opera I, I'd ever seen was Don Giovanni and, I, and Leporello. That I loved the, the relationship between the, the master and the servant. Um, so I had to learn opera, but I love Maria Callas. I saw um, a documentary on her, and I just fell in love with her. And I told Lenore that uh, um, I was going to divorce her for a dead woman. That's because you had to share her. <laughs> But I'm glad. I think that came up in our very first conversation yeah. um, back with the, the Roosevelt book. So I'm glad to hear it. Uh, it culminated. Yeah. So, okay. But while we're on with opera, I don't think we've ever really talked about dance. And when you had the yeah. uh, the, the book party for Big Red last year, um, I ended up coming face to face with one of Balanchine's favorite dancers who was oh at the party. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. So, she, Allegra Kent is the greatest dancer of the 20th century, and she's completely unknown. I don't know if you saw the piece I wrote in the American Scholar. Yeah, I read, read it. Uh, Lenore had put it up yeah. on Twitter. Okay, I came good. across it yeah. uh, last week. Yeah, she's. it's very sad to me that uh, when I first saw her dance in, in, at the New York City Ballet, I, I couldn't believe it. She was possessed. She won't. She won't say that. You know, she doesn't like that word. Let me tell you. When we introduced ourselves to each other, um, and I had to tell her I don't know anything about ballet, she's like, "Well, Balanchine liked the way I performed." Yeah, it was her her yeah. low key way of putting it. But but yeah. So she knocked you off your feet from. Uh... Yeah, I I just every time I saw her, she was so different from every other dancer, is that she was in a different world. And uh, she had that music that I that I loved, and uh, I, and I write about her in uh, A Loaded Gun, so I'd, I'd like you to read it. Yes, um, she is one of the great. Balanchine was one of the great experiences. Uh, to me, he was the greatest artist of the twentieth century, in, in that he not only perfected ballet, but he fused ballet and music in, in a way that no other, I mean, I don't know enough to to make any grandiose claim. I've never seen, you know, I've seen Jerome Robbins' ballets, I've seen other ballets, but never like Symphony in C, where the music becomes the form and the dances sort of fill up the space in terms of the music. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Where did dance begin for you? And what was the, the learning curve in terms of trying to understand meeting, it? Meeting a, a dancer in, in a health food shop. and I, I thought you'd I, already... Okay. Oh, I'd yeah. already gone to... Yeah. Because my, my girlfriend at that time, Karen Kennelly, I think you, you know her. Maybe she was the head of uh, Pan, American Penn. Oh, that's great. Um, and she loved the ballet, so I went to the ballet with her. And then I met Debbie in, in a health food store, and you know. And, um, when and did I you was, feel you underst not understood, understood? But when did you feel you appreciated what you were looking I at? I felt the, the the power of the music. And there was one ballet. I mean, the the recent biography of Balanchine is wonderful, but. Uh, Mr. B? Yeah, yeah, Mr. B, but but the author 
leaves out my favorite ballet, Who Cares, which is to Gershwin's music. And there's a pas de deux between uh, um, Jacques D'Ambois and, uh, and another, another dancer. And it's just extraordinary, the, the freedom, the joy, the... the uh, I love it, I, I, and I write in, in the article that I could see that ballet every day of my life. Yeah. It's so filled with joy. Uh, um, what's her name? Patty... Um, Patricia McBride. Yeah. This, this part of the between Jacques D'Ambois and Patricia McBride. Well, was it a form you had any affinity for? Before you started, no, I yeah. didn't know anything about. I didn't know anything about music or you know symphonic music, classical music. I didn't know anything. I love classical music, but I don't know what I'm listening to. I mostly listen to Mozart and Beethoven, but because I have Alexa, I can just say play. Yeah, yeah. You I'm know, used to. Alexa, fuck you, play this, yeah. you know? <laughs> and she does it. You know, she's my slave. But uh, classical music to me. As much as I like, you know, Bob Dylan and and, uh, and Leonard Cohen and and, and 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 other wonderful artists, uh, the classical music soothes me in a way that uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. I it's hard for me to understand. You know, the thing is when we're we're so supercilious about past civilizations. Oh. In the 18th century, they didn't have uh, bathtubs. They didn't have running water. You know, they were not civilized. But they were much more civilized than they were. They produced Mozart. They produced Beethoven. We haven't. We produced Cormac McCarthy. Great. He's a wonderful writer, but he's not Mozart. Yeah. Was he? Do, do you put him in the? I'll say pantheon. I keep going with these yes, uh, Olympic I think terms. Paul McCarthy is, is, yeah. is a great, great writer. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, and I did, you know, I don't know if you saw it, in, when they had his obituary, they, they quoted my review. Oh, uh, both, yeah. Both the Washington Post yeah. and the New York Times, it was in the first paragraph. Because I understood him. I understood what he was doing. It was all about music. Did you know each other? Oh, no, I never met him. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you had and any... And he, he did a wonderful film. I don't know if you've uh, seen... I mean, when I say he wrote a wonderful film called The Counselor, I would suggest... I've you, heard of, I heard about oh, it, but I haven't see seen it. it. I think it's, it's on so, Netflix. It's so intelligent. Yeah. It's really the most intelligent film I've ever seen in my life. Most articulate film. It's really a film about a screenplay, where the screenplay overpowers... The language overpowers the image. Did you want to write more film yourself? Uh, no, I, 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 I write about film, sure. but I wouldn't... Um, to me, writing a film is, is writing a, uh, an outline for something because it's a director's form, not, not the writer's form. But in this, this particular film is a writer's film. It's the only writer's film I've ever seen where the screenplay is so overpowering because you have a genius, yeah. you know, writing it. You don't usually have geniuses writing for cinema. All right, we took a little break here so Jerome could stretch his legs, and he started talking before sitting down again, so that's why it's going to sound like what it sounds like. Yeah, the, the, the thing I was um, speaking to you before about... Um, about, you know, what happened to the Jews and Tom Stoppard's play, which yeah. I wanted to go to because I thought, ah, finally, because I love Tom Stoppard. I mean, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Just, I'm a big Arcadia, Mark. Uh, yeah. Arcadia from the early 90s is yeah. one of my all-time. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't go to the, to the theater. It's the only play I wanted to go see, but... It's hard for me to, to go sit in a theater now because if I have to go to the bathroom or something, I have to go around. It's a production, yeah. So I said, okay, Tom Stoppard is going to do it. He's going to turn 
what happened to the Jews into a, a victory rather than a defeat. And I read the play, and I love Tom Stoppard, and I didn't, and, and my assistant screamed at me and said, because he went to the play with Lenore, and he said, you didn't see the actors, you know, you didn't see the play, you only read the play. Well, I said, well, you know, I read Hamlet, I love every <laughs> line, and I don't love this play. Yeah. So he didn't do what I wanted to do, is to turn those victims, to turn it around. As victimized as they were, they, they triumphed. Yeah. And, and, and I, I didn't feel that, that Stoppard did that, even though I totally admire him as a writer. Yeah, but Leopold Stadt, I haven't read it yet. Yeah. I also got it and wanted to get to the theater, never went, blah, blah, blah. But I wondered about somebody who discovers he's a Jew late yeah. in life trying to to capture a, a Jewish experience, especially uh, a Central European Jewish experience around the... Well, the, I, 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 I'm not faulting him for No, no that. I just don't know how... I, how, I, I you don't... Know. It's just that I didn't... I expected to love it, and I love his language, and I didn't feel the language in here. I, I couldn't identify with it with any, any of the characters. As a matter of fact, the only character I could identify with was... Um, a Nazi officer, you know, not identify with, but I mean, he you had a certain a life. Yeah. yeah, he had a certain individuality that the other characters just didn't have. Mm -hmm. But I hope Tom Stoppard doesn't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> he turned me down. I, 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 I offered to, to fly out to England yeah. to record with him, and, and I dropped the, the yeah. Clive James name yeah. to, to get it, and right. it was still, he's not interested. I'm like, okay, well, I just, you know. He's 86 years old. I know, well, you know, you're. I, I I recorded with Jules Pfeiffer when he was older, and uh, Jules Pfeiffer is great. Yeah, um, but I, I was disappointed yeah. because the music that I saw, and 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 my assistant says, "Well, you you haven't seen it, you know." And I said, "Well, I do see it when I read it, you know. I can imagine the character." Yeah. I wonder if they do any of those uh, uh, closed circuit. TV, like the, the simulcasting of, of some of the plays. I remember they did it with The Hard Problem many years yeah, ago. I, I, I really don't know. But yeah, it's um, I, I, I understand. I, that was just my trepidation was uh, somebody coming late to the Jewish experience sort of trying to make up for lost time. Um, but again, no, I haven't I'm, read it. So I, 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 yeah. I'm not in any way faulting him. Yeah. I just was disappointed in the language. So when you talk about I don't want to say having sympathy, but feeling that Nazi character as, as a real, more real figure. One of the aspects of Ravage and Son that most affected me was the Lionel Ravage, the, the yes. patriarch, and the, yes. the, the man he becomes. He's, he's a bad man at the beginning, but he's, yeah. he does find some sort of redemption and then gets destroyed. You understand. Yeah. He's been destroyed. The, the 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 woman that he loved was was, and the cat that he loved yeah. were, were both taken from him, and so he becomes a monster. And I don't know if you've read my. If you get a chance, uh, I did an introduction to, to Jekyll and Hyde. No. And um, if you can ever find it, you might want to read it, because I. I Everyone speaks about Jekyll, but I love Hyde. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to do a Jewish Jekyll and Hyde. And, and like, like everything I do, it's just one element that's not, you know, it, it's a symphony. So it's part of the symphony, but it's not central to it. So what, what's central to it is the music of the landscape, you know. In other words, um, this this is a, a novel about a time and a place, and the characters move in and out of that time and that place, but it's a very particular time and a very particular place and a time and a place that disappeared. The Lower East Side, I mean, when I grew up as a kid, New York City was a Jewish city. I mean, 85% of the students at 
uh, City College were Jewish. You know, now they're probably, uh, you know, um, uh, Chinese. Um, but the thing is that um, it had its own resonance, its own music, its own past, and um, and it's gone. You know, I've lived long enough to see it disappear. Whereas when you know when you that that's <laughs> yes Here comes your cat. <laughs> yeah, come on, there you go. That's one advantage to living long enough is that to understand that nothing remains, that everything disappears. You know, when I was a kid, the Grand Concourse was, I don't know if you've ever been there, the, the Art Deco buildings, they're absolutely beautiful. And um, now it, it's, it's partly a slum. I mean, so um, nothing remains. Everything is fluid. And you can't um, you can't stand still. You know, if you stand still, everything will go past you. You have to move. It's a river. You know, you know, as Thomas Wolfe said, of time and the river. But um, the thing is that we're, we're constantly moving, and, and I think if there ever is going to be a, a history, the history is going to be. Pre-Trump, Trump, and post-Trump. Yeah. You know, he's overpowered everything. Maybe Biden will be the one, and I'm not, I'm not the one who first said that, maybe he will be the one who is remembered because he's been a great president. And I, it, it seems to me the only fault he did was, was in, in Afghanistan, you know, but I don't know why he did such, such, such a stupid thing just to understand that, that by taking American soldiers out of there, you destroyed half the population. Women no longer had a life. Yeah. Didn't he understand that? Didn't, didn't he take? Didn't somebody think about what would happen to the women in that country once we left? I mean, it's it's horrible. It's disturbing that no one really understood that or women they would no longer and go to school. They would no longer. They may have felt that American voters wouldn't care about what happens overseas. I know you and I care, but, yeah. you know, the average voter just has a, our but money's going there instead of, you know. I don't see how you can do that to a society. Yeah. I mean, to, that was the Colin Powell doctrine, you know, you break it, you bought it. That was, uh, yeah. you, you go in and do something in a country like that, you're responsible going forward. And it's sad to me about Colin Powell because he was a, extraordinary man and he bought into that lie to that bush lie about uh, uh, Iraq well, yeah. any, anyway it, it, um, we've lived through some interesting history or terrible history I've lived through history and I've seen the history change and, and it frightens me to see that Trump has such a support even after we we've, we've seen his criminality and the fact that he's stealing from people and yet people will still vote for him. I, I'm, yeah. As Shakespeare would say, it beggars the mind. But it doesn't... He's going to triumph. You know. Or per Lincoln, our, our better angels. Yes, the better angels have disappeared. But, and, and of course, Lincoln was shot. You know, yeah. If he hadn't been killed we would have had a, some kind of closure to the Civil War. And everything that happened, and I'm not the first one to say that, nor will I be the last one, everything that's happening in this country comes right out of the Civil War. We could not close that, that horrifying gap. And now to think about people talking about slavery as a kind of trade school <laughs> yeah. is really... Oh, is, is, yeah. is horrifying. And again, it, it took about three days for that to evolve into well, the people who survived the camps also developed yeah. skills. And it's like, yeah, this is the language they want to use to make it seem like these things I, I aren't as bad as... I it's not going to work. Yeah. But yeah, that idea of Lionel as, as destructive agent, someone who is in love with destruction, um, 
But did feel some resonance with the time we live in. Because taken away from him. Yeah. So um, he's pure hatred. But he, lo- he loves Clara. You see, he and his son love the same woman. woman. And uh, I am Ben Ravage, you know. Yeah. So when you read the novel, see me there in that role. I'm Superman taking off Superman's clothes <laughs> and putting on Ben's derby, you know. And I am Lincoln, you know, and I'm Emily Dickinson. I am, you know, it's about myself, you know. Even though the guise is perfect, you know, the research, I always research. I mean, on anything you see there, if I, if I make it up, it's because I want to make it up. It's not because I don't know the history. I always read for months and months before I enter into any kind of landscape. And the world, the world you evoke in this book feels very lived in, beyond the, the musicality yeah. of the language, like we talked about, just the, the but, sense but of... Of course, remember, yeah. I, I lived it as a kid. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. But even then, you were getting to it after things had started to, to decline but it or But it wasn't that different. The yeah. poverty, okay, the sweatshops were no longer sweatshops, but they weren't that different. The prostitution um, was no longer there, but it still was a landscape where women did not have very much maneuverability. You know. So for you, post-Ravage, knowing that Maria Callas is, is finished, and this YA novel, or YA book, what comes next? What are you thinking uh, about? I, I've, I've already... Uh, I'm in the middle of another novel about a, a kid who lives... He's nine years old, has been deserted by his father, and lives in a hotel, the Concourse Plaza. So I'm in the middle of that novel, and I, I've now done the first draft of the YA novel. And um, I'll let it sit and uh, I'm going to work on a play about Tut Shore. I don't know if you know Tut yeah, Shore yeah, was. Yeah. So. You like writing theater? I, I, there's a particular reason. There's an actor attached to it, and I, I mm-hmm. probably can't. No, no, don't, don't say anything. Give his but... name, but it's, it's, it's for an actor. And yeah. I don't know whether it will be made, but it's a challenge, and. The fact is, can I do it? I don't really know, but I'm going to try. I think it's it's time for you to spread your wings and, and you know, find some new forms to work in. No, but look, when you're white and 86 and a male, there's very little room for you in this culture. You you know that, Gil. You know? Yeah. So you have to maneuver um, the world outside this room really doesn't exist, so I'm what I'm writing for, I, I do have a publisher for the YA novel, and I do have a publisher for the Maria Callas, but it, the, the, the landscape has changed, and seriousness is gone, and that's why I'm so glad to see that a film was made about Oppenheimer, and I curse myself that I didn't do a novel about Oppenheimer, because I could have, why, I, you know, why I didn't, I really don't know, because he, you know, he's so important, you know, the, and also the physical image of him in that hat. I haven't seen the film, but I'm looking for, and I like Christopher Nolan as a director, so I'm glad to see that there still is some seriousness left, because you can't watch television now, and you can't go to the movies, and there's nothing out there. Well, I don't know if you feel that way, but I just feel it. It's superheroes. It's uh, it's very poor writing. It's as if the writing doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. It's very to me. It's very sad. But you've lived long enough. That's the price you have to pay. The idea that we 
get some of these gems. And again, this is part of why I do this. You know, yeah. I'm not sitting down with some 25 year old, you know, hot young novelist thing. I'm much more interested in, in people who've. Yes, but you might yeah. find a 25 year old who has a sense of language and. You should be fair to that twenty-five-year-old. Yeah, too. yeah, that's always a possibility. I just, yeah. I, I like the, uh, the weathering of time, yeah. and and you know what what it does to us and what we learn from it. Yeah, yes. how we start to see ourselves in our work as you came to do over the course of your career. Well, I don't see it as a career. I see it as an apprenticeship. Yeah, and the thing is that you're always learning. You want to make, you're a cobbler trying to make the perfect shoe. And it can never be perfect, but on the other hand, what you want to do, you know, going back to the image of the atomic bomb, I want an atomic bomb of feeling to be in Ravaging Sun. Mm -hmm. I want it to move the reader to tears. That's, that's the only purpose I have. I want you to cry when you read the book and to feel the sadness of the time. And maybe I won't succeed, but that's my mission. You succeeded. Yeah. I, trust me. Yeah. This book, it, um, I don't record with as many novelists now because it's, it, it can be tougher to start a conversation about right. a novel that doesn't turn into where do your ideas come yeah. from. Um, but, you know, when your PR person mentioned this, I'm like, it's, it's Jerome and it's going to be something yeah. It's not even a, a biographical fiction. I'm, I'm going to dive into this. You um, you evoke a lot of feeling from me over the course of this book and a lot of I wanted to a lot of sympathy. It was. Uh, as I say. You want you want the reader to explode. You want it to me. The feeling is everything. That's why I, I love Henry James and hate him because he's a great, great writer. But you don't love the characters, or I don't love them. He doesn't want you to love them. Yeah. He wants you to love the form. And he invented the modern novel, the idea that the novel had a form until, you know, in the 18th century or even Dickens or whatever it is, don't think you don't use the word form you just you have a beginning you have a middle and the end and when henry james suddenly uh oh that no longer works yeah. you've got something else you've got structure you've got you know uh you're building a kind of uh house you know a house of prose and that changed literature forever but I still hate him and love him. <laughs> like I said, you've written an incredible novel and you got your own back on, on Henry James. So, yeah. But Jerome, thanks so much for coming on again. Oh, you're and very welcome. Like to, I hope, well, we'll get together for Maria Callas, but I hope we've managed to get together before that for another... Uh, oh, sure. Sure. And that was Jerome Charon. I loved his new book, Ravage and Son, which is out now from Bellevue Literary Press. Go get it and go check out his 50 plus years of, of books, including the ones we've recorded about in the past. Sergeant Salinger, uh, Big Red about Rita Hayworth and The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy King, his novel of Teddy Roosevelt, which was the first one we recorded around. I did buy both of his Dickinson books after our session. Uh, they, along with Cesar, are on my non-pod guest to, to be read stack. Along with, if you listen to last episode, uh, the Hilary Mantel trilogy, uh, Wolf Hall, which Ron Rosenbaum recommended. So I've got a lot of extracurricular reading to do on top of all the pod guest stuff. But that's me and my life, you know. Now, you can support the virtual memory show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week, even when the host has a uh, oral surgery and, and infection and, and all this other crazy stuff, but uh, that he keeps putting out these great conversations with really fascinating writers and artists and publishers and translators and all sorts of other creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or TV show or book or music or, or piece of theater or comic or art exhibition or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. 
You can do that by emailing me, by DMing me if we're connected on social media, uh, through postcards or letters. You can get my mailing address from the end of the, uh, the sub stack that I send out every week or by leaving a message on my Google voice number. That's 973-869-9654. Uh, those messages go directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go longer than that, you'll get cut off. Just call back and, and leave the rest of your message. Oh, and let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something really interesting to share with the listeners, but I would never run something like that without the guest's approval or without the speaker's approval. So let me know. Now, if you got money to spare, don't give it to me. This one actually cost a little bit because I did this and the Ron Rosenbaum episode together, had to pay for tolls and parking to get into New York. And and with Ron, I had to go buy an extension cord um, and, and get an Uber or Lyft across town to, to get back to my car after all sorts of other crazy stuff happened. But really, you know, I work at my day job. I get paid pretty well. Uh, it offsets all this stuff. Uh, so if you've got money to spare... Give it to people or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, and all those other crowdfunding platforms, where there'll be lots of people who need help with, with basic expenses, with, with rent, with veterinary bills, with getting artistic projects off the ground, all sorts of stuff like that. If you're really insistent, um, you can go subscribe to my Substack and do the paid subscription. It's vmspod.substack.com. It's 50 bucks a year. That just goes to like supporting all of this. Um, but when it comes to institutions in need, uh, I give to my local food bank every month. I make donations to the Poor People's Campaign, Women's Choice and Planned Parenthood. I make targeted election contributions, but that's part of my gig as a lobbyist. Um, but there are all sorts of things you can do with your, your money or time to, to help us build a better world. So, um, you know, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, Th. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs>